you can still have a craftsperson conversation after that, which is to say like two performers in an amazing drama might put on a show and everybody, you know, like Hamilton, right? You watch Hamilton, everyone in the audience is just gaga. Like this is the best <laughs> thing I've ever so seen. so into Hamilton. I, I guarantee backstage, Tommy and Lynn are like, all right, this sucked, that sucked, this needs to be tweaked. Hey, everybody, welcome to the show. This is Brave New Work, a podcast about reinventing our organizations and the search for a more adaptive and human way of working. I'm Aaron Dignan, and I'm joined by my admirable co-host, Rodney Evans. <laughs> Hello, everyone. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the old aphorism, it takes one to know one. But before we unpack that, why don't we get to know each other a little better? Okay, so we will do a check-in round because we do check-in rounds. If you don't know why we do check-in rounds, for the love of God, just go back and listen to some other episodes. <laughs> Any I can't other keep episode. saying it all the time. And I know you don't <laughs> want to hear me say it. No one wants to hear me say it anymore. So if you don't know why and this is confusing to you, catch up. That's okay, it. We're so dropping check-in it. round question. <laughs> <laughs> question for today is, if you could live in a house that had any architectural style what would you pick and why oh this is so easy it would be a second empire home with a mansard roof that like old kind of hitchcock psycho kind of looking architecture if you remember what the old hotel looked like the Bates motel that kind of angled you know I steep do. roof with the little widow's walk at the top and the victorian features yes and why? It's this weird intersection in history where design was flamboyant and fun and expressive and they were doing a lot, but also craftsmanship and care was also high. And so it's like, it's the period in architecture, in my opinion, where they were doing a lot and doing it well, which mm -hmm. kind of speaks to parts of me that you know already. That's amazing. So for me... I am very drawn to anything that is Baroque Revival era. And I just discovered this about myself during the pandemic that I was having a conversation with someone about architecture. And I remember being in Budapest a really long time ago, like 15 years ago or something. And I was in some park and there was a huge, beautiful, ornate public bath house structure. And I didn't go inside because I was sick as a dog and it was like four degrees. And the last thing I wanted to do was be in a public bath situation. But the outside of the building like gave me such a weird feeling energetically. Yes. And when I was describing this to someone and then I started thinking about all of the other structures that have fascinated me, like the Garnier Palace and like the Plaza de España in Madrid and all of these other places, they're all from that same period of time. And I can only chalk this up to being some past life shit because aesthetically <laughs> there's not like something about it that's so appealing to me, but it's like, it is always the building that I'm drawn to and want to go look at and just be in and around. So I think I must have like lived in one of those. All right. So Today's topic was born of laziness and a Slack exchange between Aaron and I yesterday, which is how true the old adage, it takes one to know one, really is. So we said that as children in sometimes kind of an insulting way, and in some ways not. But what it brings up is, for us, what does that really mean in a world of knowledge workers, in a world of cultivating mastery and insight in a world of self-management. Um, so because you started me with this taunt, you start with framing the edges of it for us. Yeah. Well, one thing that we've been doing a lot of at The Ready and that I've been doing a lot of is interviewing. And that's what kind of provoked this for me. Although honestly, it comes to life after the interview and in regular day-to-day -day work together all the time, which is just this idea that it does take one to know one. Like to the extent that I can interview someone that does something I don't do or that does it at a level I haven't done it at yet, I kind of, you know, there's there's not much territory there. Like, I, for example, I'm not really super qualified to interview an engineer about engineering. I just I don't know. You know, I don't I, I wouldn't know where to go. So it boils down to this reality that we have obviously very rich, complex identities with lots of 
skills and gifts and knowledge and experiences, but within the scope of any particular personality trait or habit or gift or experience, there is this reality that, yeah, it, you know, if you know, you know, and if you don't, you don't. And what's weird about that is that in a traditional hierarchical system, it is assumed that if you're more senior, you know, and if you're more junior, you don't know across all contexts and concepts. And in our systems, it's more like, well, it depends on the conversation, right? Maybe I know more, maybe I don't. But also, we don't know who is explicitly more senior at a global level. We really only mm -hmm. know it in the context of roles that people hold, experiences that they've had, mastery that they've built. And often a lot of that is somewhat opaque. And so it's even unclear, let's say a new project team forms, three random people who work at the ready are on it. What is the mastery stack of that team? Who does know? Who doesn't know? How do those dynamics play out? So uh, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about masters and apprentices, about who can evaluate who and when we even need to evaluate each other. And yeah, I just want to like lay all that at your feet. So I, I said the silly phrase yesterday, hoping that we could have a great conversation. Yeah, I love it. And uh, I've also been thinking a lot about this because of recent conversations, I think one of which we might have had on this show, about the incorrect assumptions that self-management mean flatness or bosslessness right, or right. a total lack of we're all power the same. structure. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, both we're all the same, but also we all have the same authority. We all have the same level of capacity and competence, which is a right. lie. And everybody knows it's a <laughs> lie. And I just had a really fun conversation this morning with our colleague Yehudi, who's been on this show before, about how in the absence of clarity around mastery and the absence of clarity around specific role-based authority, the implicit nature of power structures creeps in often in a pernicious way. So it's often like because we're not specific about who knows and who judges and who decides, then a lot of times things like tenure or racial or gender identity or arrogance or other things take the place of specified mastery, which is like the worst version of that <laughs> thing. So I think this is a really fruitful discussion, both in systems that look more like ours and then in systems that are more traditional or hierarchical, where exactly to your point, it's assumed that the leaders know, but they usually don't because they're not close enough to the work and they haven't been for such a long time that they're not exactly one that knows one. And yeah. so it's just, it's a, it's a it, mastery, I think is a very complex thing and it's really faulty in both directions. Yeah. And it does feel to me like, you know it when you see it, you know it when you can do it, but we don't often have the structures in place to define that stuff. We're not always clear about what skills or what kinds of mastery we're talking about. And we're not always clear about having those opportunities to demonstrate it and to demonstrate it at different levels. Which reminds me of one of my favorite stories from basketball, which I am not a huge sports fan, as any listener knows, but I do have a younger brother who is obsessed with sports and a little sports genius. So I've, I've been around it my whole life, nonetheless. And there was a moment when I think Shaquille O'Neal was promoted into the NBA and, and recruited, drafted into the NBA, playing his first game and was, you know, the like everyone was so excited about this superstar and it was going to be such a big deal. And they were playing the Bulls and Jordan got a free throw opportunity and Shaq was right next to him. And Jordan looked at him, closed his eyes, shot the shot and it went right through. And he said, welcome to the NBA. And it was like, <laughs> that's what mastery looks like, folks. <laughs> like It looks like this thing that other people find to be really difficult, I can do with my eyes literally closed because I've done it so much. I've put in so much effort and practice. And I find that it's hard sometimes in work where there are so many different surface areas compared to a sport of things you could be good at and things you could have experience with to even know like who can do it with their eyes closed without having that discussion or having that opportunity to, to demonstrate. And I would add to the complexity, even in the example that you gave, Shaquille O'Neal at his level had enough mastery to know greatness when he saw it. Right, right. Whereas when you and I are talking about things like graphic design, I don't have enough greatness to know what great is. <laughs> so it's like everything you show me, I'm like, that looks great. 
that's right. And you're like, no, it doesn't. And I'm like, to me, it does. I don't know shit. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, there is this, there is, like, I love what you're saying because I, I didn't think of this, that there is a kind of a zoom on your microscope when yes. you build competence in an area and it gets tighter and tighter and tighter such that, yes, a, you know, a 40 year veteran of graphic design can look at something and be like, I can see like an x-ray what's going on here. And a random person off the street is like, it's red. Like they, they're just like at a very different level of focus. And I do think that plays out in systems like ours when it comes down to like feedback and leveling and evaluation. You know, what level is this person in this activity? Well, if you don't have the experience they have, you're going to look at what they're doing and see kind of a blurry mastery. Which yes. is just like, I don't know, Phil is as good as Susan is as good as Mike because they're all more seasoned than me. Whereas someone that is, you know, has more experience than all three of them would be like, oh, no, 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 no. Here are the like subtle differences between what they're doing and how they're doing it. Yeah, I think that's right. And it also add to the murkiness that so much of this isn't a one to one situation. It's a one-to-many situation. So I get into this dynamic a lot at the ready where I advise projects and I'll watch someone facilitate and I don't like their facilitation style and I don't like (laughs) being facilitated by them. And a group of people at the ready or a group of people at the client is like, that was great. Yeah. And I'm like, not to me, but like, (laughs) does it matter? You know? And so this is where the nuance of this stuff comes into play. And what's the difference between preference and yes. evaluation? Yes. Right? Like, you know, it's one thing to be like, I like red, I like blue. It's another thing to be like, I'm seeing things others aren't seeing. Right. And the complexity of in, in a question like facilitation, there is the thing of like every person who's in that experience shows up to that experience with their own global biases and preferences and then with their specific bias and preference about that moment. So it's like some people show up to that situation being like, I really want to be tightly held and guided and coached. And some people show up to that and are like, God, you're so, this facilitator is so overbearing. I wish you would just (laughs) shut the fuck up. And it's like, you can't just have the average of those things. But in that situation, what is good? And this is where the nuance of mastery and and understanding and being able to give people good feedback gets really difficult. Yeah. And this is, It brings to a point for me the fact that I believe when it comes to discussions of mastery and these like complex or soupy spaces, it just boils down to outcomes to me. Like it, yes, there are preferences and yes, there are subtleties and there are probably things that we could, if we had the ability to like get inside everyone's head and pull them and, and, you know, figure out exactly what happened, we could do more fine grained analysis. But at the end of the day, I just boil it down to like, can you make happen? Can you navigate? Can you get to the place you want to get to consistently, regardless of the circumstance, the more, you know, the more nutty, the circumstance doesn't matter, you're still getting it done. That to me is a kind of a mastery where at least we can say, all right, look, you know, if they get the outcome they want, and that includes, you know, attitudinal and reaction and emotional outcomes too. So like, it's not just do they get the sale every time they go on the client sure. call. It's do they get the sale in a way that reflects our principles and values and in a way that leaves the person that got sold feeling connected and authentic and, you know, being treated fairly and honestly, all that kind of stuff, right? Then if they can do that, then I think I'm okay if there's a style difference or if I would do it differently. Because there are people I've met in my career and people that have mentored me in my career that do stuff very differently than I do it. But I would totally say they have mastery of it, if not more than me, for sure. I mean, it's just like, look, that's working, you know, like that works every time, but it wouldn't work for me. And I think the outcome orientation really is the simple move here that cuts through complexity and is very complexity conscious. Um, So maybe we'll just end the episode right here because we've fucking nailed it as usual. All right. But, Thanks for coming uh, to our TED Talk. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> please, please leave us a review. Uh, so I had my first group coaching session last night led by Akila, and it is a small coaching group for non-Black women to become better allies, et cetera. And we were having a discussion about a particular situation, and she said the same thing. 
Mm. And she was basically like, look, the outcome was there. Like the outcome that you wanted happened. So like, that's enough. And yeah. she went a step further, which I think was relevant and helpful to me in that scenario, but is also helpful in this conversation, which is if you keep sort of hand wringing beyond that, at some point you are now centering yourself in the mastery of others. So it's like at some point, if you got what you wanted or you got for someone the thing that you thought they deserved, but you want to sort of like make your point or be <laughs> the judge or be punitive or hold people to account, at some point you're making that shit about you. And even though this was in the context of an equity discussion, I think the same is true in terms of what we're talking about, which is, you know, if I facilitate the session and you think that I totally bricked it and the client is like, that's the best meeting we ever had. At some point, if you just want to bang on about all of the things you think I could have and should have done differently, now it's just about you. And now it's just about sort of like your ego and your interest in judging and your discomfort with me being able to get an outcome in a way that doesn't make sense to you. And so I think this is a thing for those of us who have mastery in certain domains to start to learn, which is like, if the outcome's there and it's nailed... Maybe still give the feedback if it feels right, but maybe stop and think about whether you're actually starting to make this about you, not the person who you are trying to help, quote unquote help. I, I think that's exactly right, particularly because when you're doing something that involves other people, performing, facilitating, coaching, advising, consulting, they are evaluating your mastery from their level at it, from their situation. And so if they're satisfied, we don't know where their sensor is in terms of that that zoom and that microscope. And as a result, we kind of have to just let it go in terms of any certain critical feedback where it'd be like, look, it worked. They're psyched. And in many ways, that's how the ready works, right? We look at like, who gets renewals and expansions? Who gets clients that are psyched afterward? Who has people that tend to like generate more organic work on the back of their interactions? Like that's the best evidence the only caveat I would offer to what you said that I think is actually really fun is you can still have a craftsperson conversation after that, which is to say like two performers in an amazing drama might put on a show and everybody, you know, like Hamilton, right? You watch Hamilton. Everyone in the audience is just gaga. Like this is the best <laughs> thing I've ever so seen. so into Hamilton. I, <laughs> I guarantee backstage, Tommy and Lynn are like, all right, this sucked. That sucked. This needs to be tweaked right? Like it is this idea of they're seeing things we're not seeing. And also they're not saying it with certainty. They're, they're toying with and playing with the possibilities of what could be better and how it could be better. So I like that idea of like, look, if the outcome's great and I come at you with feedback, we're having a, a peer-based conversation at that point about like what I noticed and what you noticed and how it could have been better, but not a conversation about like, I know that you did it wrong and here's how you can do it better. Because the outcome is the outcome. Yeah. It's like nerding out. It is. Absol absolutely. And like everything else that we bang on about, if that's <laughs> what you're doing, just be clear that that's what you're doing. That now it's like, now we're doing masterclass, like tweaking stuff. Let's be clear that the outcome happened full stop. And then if, if you want to have further discussion about what I noticed as a data point of one, let's do that as, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. as its own, as its own conversation. <laughs> Well, because I think those things get muddled. And I think mm -hmm, when you're yes. someone who is seen as having mastery, then your feedback and opinion and judgment is often sort of taken as being correct. And even when you're very clear that it's one person's opinion, it still carries outsized weight if you are because mastery comes with power. So you, I think you have to sort of overdo it if it's like, okay, you made the shot. That's cool. Now in the locker room, we're, we're going to talk about what I might have done differently. But like you made the shot and that is more than sufficient. And a lot of times like there's a nuance in here as well that I think about a lot with clients and people uh, who have less experience doing the kind of work that we do working with clients, which is that like most of our clients are total noobs. So, you know, somebody who has six months of really solid org design consulting experience is six months ahead of the client. And with clients particularly who are like working and living two decades ago, six months into the future of work is really far for them. And like, 
I seem like a space alien to those people. Whereas someone who is like maybe not quite as far along in their mastery of our space might actually be like a more accessible and relatable person for the client than me who's just like, fucking kill that system, fire those leaders, (laughs) like give away this power. Like, you know, it's like, it's like those levels of mastery, I think, I think can serve in different scenarios in a way that's really positive, it's not always about just having the most. It's like you don't need Michael Jordan to coach kindergarten basketball. Right, right. And in many ways, seeing the potential for those matches is a form of mastery, which is to say like, okay, that's I've, right? I've seen all the gradations of this and the fit between the guide and, and the guided, and I know that I'm not a good fit for you. Which is, I didn't, I mean, when I first started in consulting and I was going into boardrooms, I was like, I'm a good fit for everybody. And my style is the only style, (laughs) you know? And now it's like, oh God, there's so much more subtlety to it. And so of course, yeah, the fact that you're talking about that and seeing it is, is important and, and is, you know, is helpful to just say like, look, this is, this is a fit thing. The other thing that, that came to mind when you were talking was the idea that not only do you need to be specific in the moment about the kind of feedback you're having or the kind of discussion you're having, but I actually find it to be fairly helpful to define the relationship that you have within a craft. So like, do you have a master and apprentice relationship with someone or not? When does that shift or change? Do you have a peer-based relationship with someone in an area of craft? And how does that, you know, shape shift? Because it does, it does materially affect every interaction. And I think it's easier to decide for a period of time the nature of the relationship than having to manage every single interaction. Yes. You know? Absolutely. I I could not agree more. And to me, what you are articulating is the quote unquote leadership play in self-management, which is no in various relationships or contexts or projects, who is going to be the master and who's going to be the apprentice. Right. 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 That's totally cool. I would say that's something that I have allowed to emerge organically that I wish I had more structure around, you know, over the last five, six years. But like there are people at the ready who have just explicitly been like, teach me this thing. Mm -hmm. And we have that kind of relationship about sales or growth or facilitation or whatever it is. And then there are other people where we've never had that conversation. And to be honest, I don't go there. Like I just don't offer any of that because it doesn't feel to me and this might be my own personal hang up but in a self-managed system it doesn't feel like just because I think I have mastery I can and should go exert it over people and be like you're my, you're my apprentice now <laughs> I, that's not how it works I, I treat it more like an invitation which is just like if you notice somebody and I do the same thing in my life like if I notice somebody who's doing something that I want to be able to do I ask them yeah you know and I'm just like look you're doing stuff. I want to know how to do what you're doing. Can you teach me? You know, can you yeah. work with me? And it doesn't make me less than them because it's one context. Sure. You know, it's just like this person is good at getting to inbox zero. Teach me. I'll be your yeah. apprentice. We're still two adult human beings. I haven't like changed the power dynamic globally. I've sure. just changed it in that one area. I hear you. And also, <laughs> There is also a thing here, which is I don't believe that you should be like, hey, you're my intern now. Let's let's shadow me and learn stuff because right, I'm right. killing it. That being said, and one of the things I wanted to talk about in this episode is how do you help people cultivate insight around their own blind spots? So a really easy way to do that is through reps and experience. And the, the example of this that immediately springs to mind is me and Allie, who – has been on this show, who I talk about constantly on the show. I'm sure she wishes that I wouldn't, but I can't <laughs> help it because I love her so much. And so recently we shifted roles on a project and she is now squarely in the space of stewarding that project. And I am just an advisor and I am a very pull-based advisor. It's not like I'm in their mm-hmm, stuff. It's mm-hmm. really like, call me when you want me and call me when you need me. And that was for a variety of reasons that we made that decision intentionally. But part of that conversation was me pointing out to her the things that in our dynamic historically I have done and she has not. 
And I think sometimes in a partnership that gets lost a little bit. I mean, I think about all of the sort of unseen labor, for example, that you do in this podcast. And it's like, if you just disappeared for a week, I'd be like, "Uh uh-oh. I don't know how we make this thing. I just show up and talk. And I think sometimes the same thing happens like in projects where it's like Allie probably hasn't always tracked all of the bits and pieces of stewardship. And that doesn't mean she's not fully capable of doing all of them immediately. It just required a conversation for me to be like, hey, here are some things that in the last couple of years I've probably put more thought into than you've needed to. Now you need to do that. FYI, or they're not going to happen because nobody else will. And so I, to me, that's sort of the blend of, you know, not going to someone and being like, you're my apprentice now, but being like, if you're stepping into this role that I have held historically, here are some things that you might not realize that role entails. And here are some skills that you might find you need to emphasize or cultivate or gain more mastery around that might not be super, super obvious just by sort of being around. I like that. And in some ways that the earliest form of, you know, sharing and spreading mastery is just sharing what to notice. So it's like the more advanced stuff is obviously direct feedback and and suggestions and tips and tricks and principles and all those sorts of things. But but there also is just this thing of like things you're probably not seeing or looking at again, back to the microscope analogy, like This stuff that happened behind the scenes, this stuff Mm -hmm. that other people don't see, you know, great performers in any space have that ability to say like, oh, the, you know, the wind, like, like I was reading about some of the sharpshooters that do like long range target work, you know, a mile away. They're literally calculating the curvature of the earth in addition to like one mile an hour of wind and doing pretty advanced math. In very real time. And then suddenly, you know, it's going to strike a target 5,000 feet away. That idea of like, oh, yeah, you know, I wouldn't have noticed a one mile an hour wind. Right. So I do like the noticing part of it as just the first thing. to Because it isn't what I like about pointing out and noticing if it's not about the person in particular, that becomes more like feedback. But if you're just noticing something about the way something works or what's going on in the outside world is it doesn't feel ego threatening at all. Totally. You know, like you and I have been facilitating together and you're like, hey, everybody looks like they need a break. (laughs) It's just like, (laughs) yeah, they do. (laughs) I was not paying attention to that, (laughs) you know, and because I would just go until I fell over like an energizer bunny. So like, you know, things like that, I think are, they're non-threatening in a way, but they also help build mastery. Yeah. So when you think about the flip side of that, if you're someone who needs to gain more mastery. How do you assess your own needs? Like this to me is like a little bit of a difficult nut to crack. I've been talking about this a lot recently for a variety of reasons. It's like, if the issue is absence of insight, how does one create insight? Uh, it's very, you know, it becomes a very circular, a circular problem. <laughs> problem. And, and I'm not exactly sure how to fix it. So this sort of goes at a few of the things we wanted to hit on. One is like, how do you really know if you have mastery? And conversely, how do you know if you don't? And how do you gain insight into your own gaps, needs, et cetera, especially if you don't have someone specifically saying like, yo, welcome to the NBA. So a couple hacks come to mind because to your point, yeah, it's, it. it's turtles it all the way down. So there's not going to be some grand philosophical answer. So one way to find out, one way to find out if you have mastery, I think, aside from looking at your outcomes, would be to offer your help and your advice to others and see if they go for it. So if, for example, if one of us were to drop in Slack, hey, I'm doing a one hour session on fill in the blank on, you know, two Thursdays from now, if you're interested, come. If nobody comes two times in a row, you don't have mastery in that thing. Because if you did, people that are interested in it would be compelled to come and see what you have to teach and what you have to say. So that's a silly hack that I have. But I think it's it's easy to try and easy to find out. The other thing to look at is, and, and this is what I talk about a lot with people that I coach or that invite me to try to help them, is like, what do you want? What do you want to be able to do? Or what do you want to be able to have access to? Or what do you want to be invited to do? Mm -hmm. And if there's clarity about that and you can't do it yet, then the easy move is just find someone that can and find out what the difference is. So you don't have to be able to see anything. You just have to be like, you know, I want, 
I want to be invited to that table. I want to be invited to speak at that event. I want to be able to go into a group of, you know, toxic dysfunction and turn it around, whatever it is. But I think like, yeah, if if you have a clarity about what you want to be able to do, what does that look like? That helps because you can identify what people are doing that or have that capacity and talk to them. And then the last bit is, even in the things you are doing now that you are being invited to, are you consistently getting the outcome that you want, as we talked Mm -hmm. about before? And if you're not getting the outcome that you want, once in a while, you can chalk that up to chaos. But if it's happening on a regular basis, then there's a chance to tune in and be like, why am I not getting the outcome that I desire? And who can I talk to? And the nice thing about mastery is you don't always have to learn from a master. So Mm -hmm. yes, it'd be great if you knew a friend who was a facilitator and was great at it and had a magic wand. But also, if you have a shitty session, you could find two or three confidants in that system that were there that know you and that are willing to tell you and be like, how did I blow it? Yeah, you know, and and back to our feedback episodes that we've done, like you can become your own teacher if you just let the world tell you what happened. Even without fine grained mastery, there's probably some some moves in there. And when you put the two together, you get the experienced kind of feedback of the people who experienced you. And then you get the like zoom microscope feedback of someone that has done it before or observed you doing it. They're like, Oh, well they didn't like it, but they don't know why they didn't like it, but I know why they didn't like it. And it's because you came off as arrogant. Yeah. And that really leads into one of the other things that I wanted to talk about because it shows up a lot in our work and it's showing up more and more in the world. So as more companies become more oriented to dynamic teaming and to putting people together and organizing around particular pieces of work and having all of the requisite skills in a team to actually do something and minimizing handoffs between departments and trying to break down silos and all of those things, what we end up with is teams that are more cross-functional in nature. And that's very cool in some ways. And it is also very difficult in some ways because when you are mm-hmm. the leader of one of those teams and you have expertise in one of the eight domains represented, that's challenging. When right. you are one of the eight domains and you are one of one, it is challenging in terms of gaining additional mastery or even getting feedback that you feel really like resonates, et cetera. And so I just want to talk about that a little bit because in a couple of orgs that I've worked with, this has actually become one of the gnarlier problems that I've seen. It's like once they get past the silos and they get into something multidisciplinary and it's humming, they're like, there's this like, there's this period of nirvana where everybody's like, I can't believe we didn't do this before. And then a year later, people are like, wait, how do I get promoted? And also I haven't learned shit. And also my boss has terrible opinions about my work because she's never been an engineer or he's never done (laughs) sales or she's never been a designer. And so like her feedback to me is garbage because she doesn't know what good is. So what do you do then? Great question. A couple things come to mind for me. One is that I think sometimes we misconstrue what the role is if you are meant to be leading or stewarding a cross-functional group. You're no longer playing the functional game. And sometimes people forget that where they're like, oh, now I'm playing the functional game in nine different functions. No, you're not. You've changed to a new game. And that game is an integration game of how do I get this group of experts to produce an outcome, which is about like table setting and system management and like OS work. It is not about giving the engineer feedback about engineering. That is not your job. That is not the game you're playing anymore. Like it, it just has nothing to do with the situation you've been thrust into. But I think it's hard to forget that when you've come out of a function or you have expertise within a domain, you're like, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing, but now I'm going to, uh, you know, rub this brush all over everybody. And so mm-hmm. I do think there's a phase shift that has to happen where you say, the new game I'm playing is how do I create the best possible systemic outcome for this group of people? And, and focus on that and focus on the kinds of feedback that sit across functions. So feedback about how we show up, feedback about how we make decisions, feedback about how we treat each other, about how we operate, like that stuff's all great because we're all still playing that game together in a, in a more equal way. And then the only other side of that coin that I can think of, I'm curious what else you would add, but 
is, you know, to go back to the quote unquote, often misunderstood Spotify model and say, you know, engineers, while they might be working in a cross-functional team, should still have a chapter or a cohort or a community of practice around engineering that is structured around standardization and skills and feedback and mastery and having some clarity about the level of experience and expertise that people in that community have and that people can both go to and hear from and be a part of in addition to their cross-functional work. And it doesn't take, you know, 50 hours a week to do that. You can do it in two or three or four hours a week where you still maintain that connection to craft and you maintain that connection to having something and maybe you have an apprentice or you have a master outside of your team that is someone that you are connecting with on a regular basis. That's possible. And I've seen that done well in groups that take the time to set it up. So those are my two immediate reactions. But what did I miss? Yeah, I would plus one to the chapter or COP idea and also provide the caveat that these get so jacked up when people (laughs) try to do them organically. So I'm going to tell you what not to do, please, because it's not going to serve the purpose that we're talking about. What people (laughs) do when they first spin up a community of practice is they get everybody who looks the same in terms of their job into a room and say they're going to do knowledge sharing. Mm -hmm. That's not going to get you shit. What that's going to get you is like one person giving a presentation and then another person giving a presentation and then people going, that doesn't really apply to me. And then everybody goes home and then next month they don't come. So when you spin up a community of practice, there have to be a couple of specified outcomes that you're looking for. And ideally to me, one of them is really getting coached practice around specific gnarly problems that you're facing inside your work context. So ideally, if we had a community of practice of transformers at the ready, which we don't, I'm showing up to that community being like, here is an intractable problem that I am (laughs) dealing with right now at my client. Here's what I've tried. What am I missing? What would you do? Can I show you, et cetera? And I'm getting real coaching from other people who have mastery and experience. So that's one thing is like no hand waving, be specific about the craftsmanship and what you're, where you're trying to level up. Two is 100% on the standardization. Figure out as a chapter, like what are we going after as a group of people who do the same work that should be consistent? And what I usually see evolve in those groups that do it properly is that over time, like six to 12 months in, they start going after things organizationally that bug them. So they go from like, there's too much variance, there's too much divergence, we're going to standardize this, to like, here's a domain that we should create. There's a new thing that we should own because we're the people with expertise who care and are resourced to do this. We're going to create this library. We're going to create this. We're going to invest in this new tool. Like it goes from sort of like coherence and consistency that comes from my divergence to actually creating new things to serve in a platformed way, which is really cool. But like you're, if you haven't even started yet, you're miles from there. So start with actually like coached practice and peer-based learning and coaching with the express purpose of getting better at your jobs. The other thing I would say in terms of multidisciplinary leaders is, and I'm curious if you disagree with this because it's maybe, I don't know if it's counter to what you said, but I think that there, I think one in that role needs to have like minimum viable mastery in each of the functions. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, I, what the kind of role that I play is very multidisciplinary in nature, for example. So I might not be the best person at sales at the ready, but in my role as someone who is doing multidisciplinary work and is probably leading in some ways a bunch of people who are better at those things than I am, I need to know enough about that domain to at least be useful. And the way that I define enough is based on the person who knows more than me. Mm. So it's like, if you're on my team and you're a designer, you tell me how much I need to know about design to be a useful leader to you. And it's not as much as you do, but like, it's not nothing. And so I do think there's some like basic, I think there is minimum functional expertise 
in each of the domains that you're leading that is more than nothing, but not nearly to the <laughs> extent that the experts have that's useful. That sounds right to me. Yeah. I mean, if you're gonna have if you're gonna have a coach or a leader or an integrator, then I think they need to know what the Lego pieces are that they're playing with and how they can fit together and what, you know, how to talk to, how to communicate with a designer versus an engineer. I mean, let's start right there. Like yeah. if you don't know how to communicate to people that practice those crafts, you are not going to get anywhere. So I do think you're right. I think a, a minimum level of understanding and empathy and language sharing and all that is probably necessary even to pull it off and even to do the job of, of you know, system designer or organizer. So yeah, I agree with that 100%. The only other thing I'll say that I was inspired by your comment about communities of practice is what one thing we've run into at the ready before that I find interesting is you get a big group of practitioners together, somebody asks a question, and then everybody just kind of weighs in. And it's unclear who should weigh in. And it's unclear to the asker who to listen to. <laughs> and so you get like totally different uh, answers, conflicting yeah. answers, you know, and it's like, it feels very self organizing, but it really isn't organized at all. It's and so chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so one of the things I've been thinking about is, you know, if you have some kind of a mastery awareness or mastery system, having some stewards of the community of practice who who set up and facilitate and kind of guide some of that stuff can be really useful. So that could look like someone saying like, hey, we've got a question here from Sharon you know, I think Mike would be a great person to to answer that. Mike, why don't you stand up and give us a little bit of your, ex like doing a little bit of that work of like, I can see the system and I can help connect the dots. Or the other thing that I've seen that's kind of cool is doing the equivalent of like a museum walk where you have different tables set up if you have 200 engineers in a room and each table is convened by a master who has put a situation as the label or an issue or a topic. And people can kind of go where they're cur like how to deal with X, how to do mm -hmm. Y. And people can kind of go mill around and find a community and a conversation that's localized around that. And I think that kind of like organizing of the work can also be interesting. So there's definitely no one right way to eat a Reese's here, but it does seem like you want to make sure that you know, the people who are working on their issues are either doing peer based craft conversations like we talked about, or they're apprenticing or mastering, you know, in a focused way. And it's not just a free for all. Yeah, I agree. And this sort of leads us back to the top of the episode, which is in the absence of that, what you're likely to have is people who want to play that role of being the expert in a way that is vague and power grabby and probably along the lines of identity and personality. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, just because you're the loudest, most confident, most whatever person in the room doesn't mean people should listen to you. But in the absence of clarity around who actually knows shit, that's exactly what happens. It's like people just listen to you because you sound like you know what you're talking about. And that's not good. Right. And there's a name for this, the the Dunning-Kruger effect, yes, which is exactly. where pe people who don't have a lot of experience think they know everything. And people who do have a lot of experience are like, I don't know shit. And so another good way to find a master is to ask a question. And if you get a strong, confident, straightforward answer, they might be full of shit. Yes. You know, yes. and I and like guilty is charged here as well. But the idea is like <laughs> when you ask someone that really has mastery, they give you a lot of it depends in response. And and that is frustrating as the asker, but it is a good sign that someone has seen all the possible scenarios and they've seen all the richness and complexity that is present in doing the crazy stuff we're all trying to do every day. Yeah, totally. All right. Well, I think that seems like a pretty good place to wrap up so we can get back to doing all the crazy stuff that we try to do every day. If you all like what you're hearing, we would love a review. We've gotten a lot of really nice emails from you guys lately. Keep those coming. We love hearing about topics. You probably are wondering when we're making all those topics that you send us, but we are. They're on a list. They're coming. If Aaron would <laughs> stop slacking me snarkily and then rolling into topics, we would have time to do more of them, but no promises. Anyway, forward our show to someone who needs it. Thank you. We appreciate it. 
Awesome. I will wrap up, as always, with a quick tip of the hat to Taylor Marvin for making us sound good. Brave New Work is produced by The Ready, where we help organizations around the world change the way they work. You can get in touch with us by emailing podcast at theready.com. As for you, thanks for listening. Now go change something.